Okay. We've spent a lot of time in this unit going through a variety of reform movements that emerged. We've talked about abolition. Um, we've now talked a little bit about movements for gender equality and how, you know, who are those individuals who are leading that movement. And um, we've examined utopian societies. And so now there's a few that I want to address individually. And um, the first of those you can see is education. Now, education reform is kind of a big uh, phrase, and in fact, it's something you still hear today in 2018, people talking about education reform. But I think we need to set um, the context to, you know, this time period of antebellum America, or, you know, around the Second Great Awakening. So first, we have to understand the way education sort of operated before this time period. So before... Um, Education was kind of managed individually by families. So if I had wealth or status, I might be able to hire a tutor for my child. Um, if I was working class um, or had my own sort of farm or business, uh, I may, if I'm lucky enough, be able to have a live-in tutor, somebody who would like travel to our home for a very short period of time or I would be responsible for educating the child myself. Um, of course, families that were purely working class families, um, those that were uh, dependent upon children actually contributing to the family economy, they really had no time for education because children were workers. So ultimately, um, I guess what my takeaway for you is that basically education was something that was left to the wealthy. And um, essentially, if you didn't have money, you really couldn't afford to educate your child. Now, Thomas Jefferson was a great believer that public education would create um, engaged and uh, informed citizens, right? And that would translate into voting. So he really is sort of um, one of the earliest proponents of public education. And public education, by definition, means education for all, for everyone, regardless of financial status or class. And uh, it's provided for and paid for through taxpayer dollars. So while that's a great idea, it doesn't necessarily come to fruition very easily. Um, and part of that's because there's really no system for collecting taxpayer dollars. And so that becomes a bit of a challenge. Um, but let's talk about sort of what changes emerge during antebellum America. And there's a few different changes that kind of come about. One of those is led by a man by the name of Horace Mann, M-A-N-N. -N. And Horace Mann um, served at the Massachusetts State School Board. And he was really one who thought that it was important to create a consistent routine um, of a school calendar, meaning that, you know, school wasn't just three weeks here and then maybe in another four months, you have like a week of school. And, um, you know, if you had some time, you could maybe go for these two days. Like that's a pretty inconsistent school calendar. And what we know about learning is that it's really hard to learn in chunks like that. So um, Horace Mann instead sort of proposes creating a school calendar and having that calendar be based around an agricultural calendar in order to make it easier for families. So um, he's really kind of the first person who suggests that we go to a nine or 10 month school calendar. But the idea of it being a standardized 180 days, that's really more recent, guys. But um, he is sort of the first that moves in that direction of saying, hey, we need to create a school calendar. And with that, he believed we need to have consistent curriculum so that there was an idea of what somebody who was in secondary school, what they should know and be able to do. And likewise, kids in primary schools, you know, what should a student who's a first year or second year in primary be able to accomplish by the time they leave? He also believed that teachers should be trained. And so he was a real proponent of ensuring that teachers were actually educated people because um, during uh, or before antebellum America, really, guys, a teacher could just be somebody who successfully had passed that grade. So if I had passed third grade, I'm qualified to teach third grade. Um, and so, you know, I want you to turn around and ask yourselves perhaps like, well, because you've passed sixth grade, does that make you qualified to teach sixth grade? And some of you might go, yeah, I think I could do it. And others of you may recognize pretty quickly the challenges associated with that. So um, he really believed that teachers needed to be educated. And so he really pushed off a movement to create what were called normal schools. And normal schools were teacher colleges um, or teacher education colleges so that teachers were well educated in the content and in um, strategies and methods so that they could become effective educators in the classroom for children. Um, there are others uh, who try to create like readers and textbooks in order to um, solidify some of that curriculum so that it's more standardized and that it's utilized in a variety of places. But Horace Mann is really the one I want you to associate with education reform.
So let's talk next about asylum reform. Now, if you don't know what an asylum is, an asylum is a term that we use for an institute for folks who are mentally ill. Now, we need to kind of remember prior to antebellum America that the mentally ill were not treated as if they had an illness, but rather treated as if they were criminals. Today, we treat the mentally ill as though they have um, an illness and that that illness can be treated and that there is hope and opportunity for a full and satisfying life. Um, just as, you know, I have a cold and I can treat my cold um, or I have the flu and I can treat the flu. But um, unfortunately, that was not the case uh, prior to antebellum America and the mentally ill were treated as criminals as if they could somehow not be rehabilitated in any way, shape or form. And in fact, they were placed in prisons instead of receiving any type of um, mental health uh, treatments. So um, what we see sort of emerge is um, a woman by the name of Dorothea Dix, D-I-X, and she became um, a proponent, a leader of um, reforming how the mentally ill were treated. And one of the things that she did is she went in and kind of acted as a journalist and as an inspector to see what prisons were like. And what she recognized very quickly during this antebellum time is that prisons really um, – were full of those who needed treatment and not necessarily those who were being held as a form of punch, punishment or a sanction for a crime. So she set about kind of publicizing stories about her experience of, vi of visiting prisons. As a result of her efforts and work, she was able to create additional facilities or separate facilities for those who were um, struggling with mental illness and their mental health. The last topic I want to talk about is temperance. So um, let's talk a little bit about what temperance is. And the root of temperance is to temper, which is to reduce. So when we're talking about antebellum America, we want to talk a little bit about reducing the use of alcohol and versus a prohibition. Prohibition means the prohibiting of that um, product. So temperance was something that was heavily engaged with women. Um, and part of that is because you know, women, since they are the moral leader of the family as part of like the cult of domesticity, which we talked about yesterday um, or the day before, women as the moral leader of the family were oftentimes seeing their families impacted directly by uh, alcoholism. And um, in 1825, we see the foundation of the American Temperance Society, uh, which is founded in New England. And uh, within 10 years, there's actually over 8,000 different chapters of this group. And more than um, 1.5 million people had pledged to abstain from drinking. Um, the American Temperance Society was heavily engaged with the Second Great Awakening. So because people are really thinking about sin and the impact of sin on their families, they are able to um, associate themselves really with this movement. And that's one of the reasons why it becomes popular. Again, though, it's heavily popular with those of wealth and status. They were pretty engaged. But with that said, um, the Catholic population in particular, which um, is a growing population in the country at this time period, really started to feel pretty targeted. And part of that is because Catholics were using wine as part of their sacrament um, and their religious services. And um, there's already at this time period in Antebellum America, a very anti-Irish movement that's emerging. And we'll talk more about that on Monday and Tuesday. So um, you can imagine as many Irish were Catholic that they really felt targeted because of the temperance movement. Now, again, we don't move quite to a time period of prohibition that comes later. Prohibition is enacted under the 18th Amendment, and that's not going to be until the 19 teens. But there are some people who are really having conversations about that and encouraging a change in the country. So those are three different types of reform I wanted to hit on. And uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me. I'm happy to answer them for you.